I found this article about two students at the University of Connecticut who were arrested because of what they said. Now this incident and the reaction to it shows just how little most Americans know about the Constitution and the blessings of liberty it was designed to protect. So we'll discuss that next on the Constitution Study. There's one thing you have to know wherever you make your stay. Came from a long through line of everyday Americans. Well, hello there, everyday Americans. Paul Engel here once again with the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution and teach the rising generation to be free. I'm glad you could join me today. As always, head over to that website, constitutionstudy.com. That's where you'll find everything I'm working on. You can find out where I'm speaking. You can find out what I'm publishing. You can keep track of the books. You can watch the videos. Everything is there. You can ask me questions. You can even ask me to come speak at one of your events. I recently was up in North Dakota speaking to a whole bunch of uh, middle school and high school students and their parents. We had a wonderful time. And though the weather wasn't very warm, the welcome in North Dakota certainly was. And I'm glad I was there. The website's also where you can sign up for the newsletter to keep track of what is coming vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution study. Hopefully I'll have some of these classes up soon and I'm still working on the book. Hopefully there'll be some news on that in the near future. With that, let's get back to this story about these two students in Connecticut. So let me start from the beginning. An October 22nd article on NBCNews.com titled, quote, Two white Yukon students arrested after video shows them shouting racial slurs, close quote, it described an incident at the University of Connecticut known as Yukon. And in this incident, two students were arrested and charged with, quote, ridicule on account of race, color, or creed, close quote. Now, if convicted, each of these students could face up to a $50 fine or 30 days in jail. Now, don't get me wrong. What these two did was stupid, nasty, and I don't believe it really belongs in a civil society. But should it be criminal? In a follow-up article dated February 21st, NBC News noted, quote, Many people applauded their arrests, but civil liberties groups condemned them as an affront to First Amendment rights. Now, if you've been studying with the Constitution study for very long, you should recognize that, while offensive and unconstitutional, arresting these two men was not a violation of the First Amendment, which reads, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. See, Congress did not write the law under which these two gentlemen were charged. The state of Connecticut did. The Constitution of the state of Connecticut clearly states, quote, no law shall ever be passed to curtail or restrain the liberty of speech or of the press. Now that happens to be Article 1, Section 5, or Article 1, Section 5 as they write it. So clearly what we have here is a violation of the Constitution of the state of Connecticut, not of the United States. Continuing from the article, on campus Monday, students marched to demand further action from the university, and they met at a gathering hosted by the campus NAACP chapter, to discuss the climate for students of color on campus. In a letter published in the student paper Monday, the NAACP, quote, also demanded that the university take action, close quote, after the parking lot incident and another that allegedly occurred at a fraternity. Now, if the university does not adequately address and handle these occurrences of racism appropriately, it will create a culture in which racism is tolerated and normalized, the organization wrote adding a list of demands aimed at making the campus safer and more welcoming to black students. Now, I understand the anger and frustration expressed by these students. I even agree with one or two of the things the NAACP is asking for. What I don't agree with is not only an attempt to improve speech, but to bully others to speak the way people want them to speak. See, there seems to be no attempt to show these two men why what they said was wrong or, or how to better deal with any feelings that might have led them to their actions. No challenging bad speech with good. Just demand that those in authority punish th these two for expressing an opinion and to punish any organization which with, with which they may be affiliated. Now, the NAACP demanded, demanded a public apology from Delta Epsilon Psi, and they and that they th be thoroughly investigated in regard to this case, but I've not seen anyone claim these two men were acting on behalf of the fraternity. The NAACP also demanded a public statement of condemnation from the university. Yet again, there's been no evidence that the university was involved. 
In fact, the only connection I have found between this incident and the university or fraternity is the fact that these two were students of that school and members of that fraternity. The NAACP went on to demand that the public university consult with them on guidelines for consequences of racism or hate speech, even though I believe what the, the students did was already a violation of school policy. The letter also demanded that the university create an indoctrination program for first-year students and make that program mandatory for graduation. And in the best example of not letting a crisis go to waste, the NAACP is demanding, demanding that the university hire at least 10 black faculty, staff, and police officers, although I'm not sure what that would do to impress the need for new speak on campus. In a statement from University President Thomas C. Casulis, quote, it is supportive of our core values to pursue accountability through due process for an egregious assault on our community that has caused considerable harm. I saw no evidence that these two students did anyone any actual harm. I don't even see someone claiming that their slurs expressed an intent to do harm. All it has done is offend a group of people. But isn't that the purpose of free speech today? To be able to say some things that other people might find offensive. Now, from the February 21st article we read, a bill before the legislature's Judiciary Committee would repeal the law, which has been criticized by law professors around the country and other groups, including the American Civil Liberties Union, which said the student's conduct was offensive, but not criminal. Well, at least the legislature of the state of Connecticut is looking at this law. I find it disturbing that anyone that believes that speech not designed to incite violence should be criminal. Scott X. Esdale, president of the Connecticut State Conference of the NAACP, said that the bill to repeal the law raises serious concerns and that he will seek opinions from civil rights lawyers and NAACP officials about the proposal. What we have here is a quote-unquote civil rights group supporting the retention of what is effectively a blasphemy law. Last year, that law was used to arrest two students for racial slurs. What has it been used for in the past? Even worse, what could it be used for in the future? Even the state's Commission on Human Rights has gotten into the act. Quote, at a time when hate and bias incidents are on the rise, it is critical that the state not remove these types of prohibitions that aim to deter or punish these, this unacceptable behavior. So their plan to deal with what they refer to as a rise of hate and bias incidents is to use hateful actions against ideas they are biased against. Does anyone else see the hypocrisy in that? And of course, we have to have lawyers coming to the rescue. Quote, it is so clearly unconstitutional under the First Amendment that it's hard to believe that this is still on the book, said William Dunlap, a professor at the Quinnipiac University School of Law in North Haven, Connecticut. It punishes speech based on the content of the speech, and that it is one of the key concepts of the First Amendment, that government cannot punish speech based on its content. As further proof of the need that for law schools to return to teaching the actual Constitution, apparently this professor at the Quinnipiac University School of Law may refer to the First Amendment, but either has never read it or really needs a reading comprehension refresher. Quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Now, I hate to repeat myself, but since these students were charged under a Connecticut law, this is not a First Amendment issue. It is a state issue. And the Connecticut State Constitution says, quote, no law shall ever be passed to curtail or restrain the liberty of speech or of the press. Whether you agree with what the students said or find it absolutely abhorrent, the questions we need to ask are, one, does the rule of law matter anymore? Two, do our rights matter anymore? What are we willing to do to defend the rights of others? If Connecticut, or any government for that matter, can regulate what you say on the matter of race, how long before it can do so on other matters as well? We have already seen people punished for expressing their ideas on marriage, transsexuality, and even climate change. Do you really want to give someone the power to tell you what you can and cannot say? How long before that morphs into regulating what you can and cannot think? Will America ever return to the land of the free? Or are we damned to be controlled? 
Will this modern newspeak brainwash out of us more than just our racism? How long before it removes the ideas of freedom, liberty, and rights? Will we ever return to the idea expressed by Voltaire? I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. So what do you think, America? Was your first reaction that this was a violation of the First Amendment, or did you recognize this was probably a violation of a state constitution? Did you recognize it was a violation of free speech? All of these are happening to us every day. The question is, when do we start recognizing? See, as John Jay noted, by knowing our rights, we'll sooner recognize when they are violated. And that's part of what we're trying to do here, is help you know what your rights are so you can recognize when they're violated. But the rest is just as true, to be prepared to defend and assert them. So have you been prepared? Are you ready now? Will you disagree with what these two students say, but still defend their, their right to say it? Will you stand up to the state of Connecticut and say, no, you're not allowed to determine what is and is not acceptable speech? Your own constitution says so. Will we defend the things we disagree with so that maybe one day someone will defend what we say that they disagree with? Tell me what you think. Head over to the website, constitutionstudy.com. Put a comment in. Let me know. Ask a question. What is your opinion? Do you have other examples? of states uh, abridging the right of free speech and you know for what may sound to be very good reasons. I mean, I believe most Americans do not wish there be racist comments spoken in public. We've kind of gotten past that, but what are we willing to do? Are we going to tamp down speech we don't like or are we going to argue it with better speech? Is the correct answer to bad speech new speak or better speech? Is it to restrict the freedom of speech or to counteract it with better ideas? Personally, I prefer to counteract it with better ideas, which is why I'm here. And hopefully, you're here too for just the same reason. And you'll stick around, so I'll see you next time on The Constitution Study. There's one thing you have to know wherever you make your stand. Came from a long line of every